Gerson managed to persuade one of anthropology's biggest names of the day, Bronislav Malinowski, also a pioneer of cultural immersion, to write a foreword to the report of Mass Observation's first year's work. But there was no statistical analysis, nor any thesis, to substantiate their findings, and that didn't go down well with the academic establishment. Once again, Harrison was at odds with conventional anthropology. By and by, I'll see my little home again, then I'm going to set all down. But as war approached, the work of Harrison and his team began to attract the interest of government. Some of the problems of running the war came directly up against the fact that a great many people did not respond in detail to many of the things they were supposed to be responding to, like the leaders in newspapers or the posters on hoardings or the shouts of the voices of cabinet ministers. They couldn't speak back. They had to listen and be loyal. Clearly, the work of mass observation, with its nationwide polling network, had a direct line to public opinion, one that the government's propaganda machine at the time did not. Tom Harrison, filmed in 1975, explains why. The Ministry of Information posters are particularly good examples of this. The first ones in the war, the first big, and it was a huge national advertising campaign plastered all over the landscape. You couldn't breathe for the stuff. Were well, these big red posters delivering unto us this message. Your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. The great emphasis put on the your, the underlining of the your, 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 and then the us. What was the contrast between the you and the us? And an extraordinary number of people raised this as a conscious point, and I'm sure many others felt it uh, unconsciously. Uh, it, it was making a dichotomy, a diversion, a, a difference, which is absolutely really fundamental in the thinking of the people who produce the propaganda between us sitting in Bloomsbury and in Whitehall, wherever it may be, and you who are the common people. But on the other hand, you would get a di different atmosphere if you took out the whys. And if you made it our courage, our cheerfulness, and our resolution will bring us victory, then you are talking a real common language of one people. But as the war progressed, Harrison's radical attitudes began to create as many enemies in Whitehall as they'd done in academia. By the spring of 1942, his funding, which by then was coming from naval intelligence, had been cut off. And Tom Harrison, along with the rest of the able-bodied mass observers, faced conscription. And so began a new chapter of this remarkable life. One that would take him back into the heartland of Borneo that he had discovered on his Oxford expedition some ten years earlier. The Japanese, by now, had occupied Borneo. The British were determined to repossess the rich oil fields there, which by 1943 were powering the Japanese war effort. They needed an expert to send behind enemy lines to lead an Australian Special Forces intelligence gathering mission prior to an Allied invasion. Second Lieutenant Harrison was offered the job. He leapt at it and left his wife and infant son. It was to be the end of his first marriage. The original plan had been to land troops ashore somewhere along the coast and then move upriver as other covert operations had done. But most of those had failed and their operatives captured and killed. Harrison, with his intimate knowledge of the interior and its people, had other ideas. He managed to convince his superiors that his team, codenamed Simut, should parachute deep into the heart of the jungle and make contact with the tough inland tribes there, far from Japanese influence. On the morning of March the 25th, 1945, Major Tom Harrison, along with the team of eight hand-picked Australian commandos, gathered at the Allied air base of Mindoro in the Philippines. Tom Harrison lined us up alongside the plane and opened a tin out of his pocket and handed us all a cyanide capsule. And uh, we decided then that, uh, that uh, this might be a bit different. 
Several hours later, they were flying in two B-24 Liberators over the mountainous interior of Borneo. However, arrival by air threatened to be as hazardous as it was by land. By the time we got to do our jump, the cloud had closed in and the pilot did his best, but we finished up five miles away up on the top of the trees in the deep jungle. In Barrio, where they landed, that momentous day is still remembered by some of the people that greeted them. One day we saw an aeroplane very, very high. Suddenly, something fell down and everybody was so frightened. They had never seen anything like it. David Labang, sitting on his father's shoulders, was watching. When you look up in the sky, then something is dropped around the, around the plane. It was a big uh, mushroom. It's come down like a mushroom. Big, big, big mushroom. And there's something hanging down there. That's like a small monkey. We call it like the orangutan. And uh, the more the lower I come down, the clearer I become is human already. He introduced himself as a major. And we don't know what the major stands for. Then he said, he's a major Tom Harrison. They asked them, are there any Japanese here? And they said, no. They said, are you telling the truth? And we said, yes. And immediately he sent out a flare with lots of smoke on it. And soon after, two more fell down from the sky. Then they went into the jungle and made a camp. The original team of eight was soon reinforced by more soldiers dropped a few days later, who became known as Simut Tu. The doctor came in with the second group of eight and countermanded one of Harrison's orders, that order being we were to go barefoot around campongs because if the Japs came up and found foot marks, they'd take it out on the campong and know we were there. And uh, he lined this uh, MD up, this doctor up, who was captain, and told him if he tried countermanding uh, any of my orders again, I'd shoot you. Harrison was sure these former headhunters would dearly love to return to the old days, and he gave them a good excuse for doing so. Harrison told the Penghulu no one was to know that uh, the white men had returned to Borneo. Any Japanese that were killed they would bring the heads back to Barrio and he would pay them five guilders per head. They were um, pale, bristly, their face was bristly, the eyelids half closed, bits of spine and gore dangling from the, uh, the base of the skull. And... Uh, that's when the nightmare started, and from that day to the star, I've had nightmares. Harrison was applying his own brand of anthropology to guerrilla warfare to make his men totally dependent on the land and its people. The Samut team had regular supply drops, but Tom would not let his men touch them. He just said, haven't got it do what the rest of us are doing, live off the land. One of the team was convinced he was dying due to a lack of medical supplies. I had, amongst the stuff I had got from the Japs, I had, got, uh, uh, I had I retained a pistol and had it ready for Harrison if he should come and visit me. And then I was going to shoot him and dump him in the jungle and uh, within a few days he'd be eaten by wild pigs and. Uh, and all the denizens of the jungle, and all the evidence would have gone. But fortunately, Harrison didn't come. For him, and for me. 